Hi, uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, the webinar today is going to be how to build large applications with React, Flux, and Angular. Uh, my name is Nick Van Wurdenberg. I'm the CEO of Wrangle.io. We're a, uh, largely a modern JavaScript consulting shop. And uh, also speaking today is Yuri Takteyev, our Chief Technical Officer. So I'm going to open up and talk a little bit about our experience building large applications with React, Flux, and Angular, delay some of the, the foundation, and then Yuri's going to take it from there. So you know, what we've learned in uh, almost three years of building large single page apps is that uh, ultimately it's about the basics of good software. And we often get distracted from this when we're working with shiny new frameworks because we think the framework is solving these problems for us. And they're not. So what we're really looking for is high cohesion, low coupling, modularity, um, you know, management of state, being able to reason about our code and effectively handling asynchronous flow because we're you know, in JavaScript in the front end and being able to manage application assets across both the development lifecycle and the application lifecycle. And what I mean about that is you're coordinating the work of a lot of different people and uh, these assets are being developed and integrated back into your code. And, and this talks more to, to process, but also to some of the tools and how we include code and, and manage dependencies. But these things become more and more apparent as we go through a, a new set of technology and we're building new types of applications and ultimately we come back to realizing we do have to solve all these problems and the framework doesn't and this drives a lot of innovation and we're seeing a lot of that in the last couple of years in, in building large apps. And we'll talk a little more about that. Some of the key large single page app technical considerations, uh, modules, you know, the definition of them, the asynchronous loading of them, the dependency management of them, uh, component models and interoperable components and libraries and this has really shifted a lot in the last couple of years you know modules are becoming part of the ES6 definition there's been a lot of innovation in the space um, component models have really come to the forefront and I think the reason component models have really started to take off are because react has really made us think more about them but we've also just hit a phase in you know this new wave of technology building these single page apps where we really are addressing bigger apps. I mean, if you think about it, in the first year of a major technology wave, nobody has built a big app yet. Uh, they're learning and uh, you know, teams are really dealing with the technology and, and you have to iterate multiple times. So I think components were happening and, and were bound to happen at this time, you know, in a lot of cases, and largely because we're just really tackling these problems now. We've had that experience as an industry going through a new wave. And that's also driven interoperable components and libraries. That's becoming very important as we deal with the, the churn of technology. We do want to be able to deal with multiple technologies at the same time. So, you know, some of the things that have been driving the new directions are ES6, observables. Um, what's really come up more you know, recently as well, though, is the separation between the view layer and the business logic layer architecture and how you solve those. Angular solves all those things sort of together as a fundamental large framework. But we're seeing a lot of uh, innovation in Angular applications that are introducing new ideas. And Angular 2 is introducing lots of new ideas um, where we're starting to think more about the view and the, the application layer uh, somewhat independently and different applications with um, warrant different strategies. Now, when you start dealing with large applications, almost all of these considerations do come into play. So it becomes more and more important. Um, you know, the front end frameworks, there's lots of them. The ones that really are front, you know, and forward in most discussions today are, you know, Backbone, Angular 1, Ember, React, Angular 2. But, you know, the big question is, what do we need to build large apps? And a lot of it doesn't have that much to do with the frameworks because we're seeing a lot of convergence in this space. And it's really about the practices and the approaches. You know, some key items, you want to separate business logic from view logic. That's sort of a given. MVC tries to do that. React has a different component model that takes a different approach. Um, you really want to be able to compose applications, so you're building more complex things from smaller independent items. You want to isolate application sections, so modularity. This feels a lot different when you're working on a large project where you start to see things grind to a halt or slow down because developers are arguing about architecture or blocking each other on building out features. And um, you know, one of the interesting things in the web development world, a lot of our knowledge is based upon teams of one, two, three people working on projects. And that's a completely different world from a 10, 12, 15, 30 person project. And that's where a lot of modularity practices really become important. And I think that's also where we're seeing this feedback into you know, the industry and our best practices 
from having done more large projects with larger teams. And, and those things now are becoming sort of the central literature and thinking in, in our sort of new wave of uh, web application development. And then the thing that I love the most about the industry in the last few years is the obsession on state, but also on being able to reason about your application. It's just a great way of looking at things. And uh, you know that's become front and center in how we think about building large applications. This is a fairly complicated diagram, and, but it's representational. If you really want to figure out what technology and what approach and what you need to put in place for a large application, there is a lot of variation. You know, if you're building a simple form application and you're scaling it up and it's, it's a crud, um, state doesn't matter that much. You're just pushing data back and forth. Components sort of matter if you want to build out lots of forms and there's a lot of repeatable sections, you know, so Angular directives or React components. That's great. That helps, you know, helps a lot. Um, asynchronous, you know, it's not that big. You're working in a, a limited page sort of context. So you're, that's one of the things with web applications is a lot of web applications just have a, a page context that simplifies things. You're working with a limited amount of data that's a subset that's being served up from the server through a REST API. So a large web application could almost appear like just a whole collection of, of independent apps. Um, you know, do you have to really reason about the application? Not so much. And so you can think about complex form applications, dashboards, graphical interactions, reporting. Size drives a lot of this. Like all things are simple when you're just building a small app. Um, we're not going to really define size here because that means a lot of different things to different people. So, you know, take it with a, you know, a little bit of flexibility here. But generally, when you start building out dashboards that have a lot of components that are reflecting similar data, uh, components become important because you want to not have to, you know, hand code all the complex sort of visualizations. Um, state becomes important for graphical interactions because you have a lot of things being updated. That kind of uh, sort of uh, you know dashboard graphical interaction experience drove a lot of what where React initially found value. Um, when you have a, a large application, you need components just to isolate things. And uh, you know, obviously, the bigger your application and the more complex, the more you have to reason about it. So these things will drive you know key considerations in sort of what you might want uh, to build your application. But you know, fundamentally, it's a large app, and if it's large, these things all become fairly important. And so ultimately, it's not about the framework; it's about the architecture. Now, architecture is a bit of a dirty word in the industry today because of you know large projects that had architecture teams, but that didn't really end up delivering that much, or weren't really based upon you know agile principles of you know building and, and validating. But um, you know, ultimately, when you're building code, you are building something that's complex and you can have an emergent architecture, but it's still an architecture. And, you know, complex top down architectures don't work very well. So combining the concepts of agile and architecture and looking at how you can drive out an emergent architecture has driven a lot of the component thinking and, and value and a lot of the sort of the enthusiasm about functional uh, programming, because functional programming sort of does enable more of an emergent architecture. And so I'm going to move on to the big picture and hand off to uh, Yuri Takteyev, the CTO of Wrangler, to uh, talk in more detail on some of these principles. Yeah, so I'll talk about now about some of the details, but before that, let's take a big, uh, quick glance at the big picture in terms of so what is it that we are trying to achieve. And so I mean, your typical complex single-page application today has a lot of the following features. It usually has lots of parts. It's where everything is connected to everything else, and the consequence of that is changing anything breaks something somewhere, right? And, and since you always need to change something somewhere, everything is always sort of broken somewhere. So this is, this is, the, this is the kind of unfortunate situation we really want to try to avoid. And it's really worth reiterating that this is achievable with any framework. I mean, you, could, you could create a mess of that sort with, with Angular, with React, with Backbone, with anything you pick, you could create a framework that you could create an application where everything is interconnected and nothing can be changed without making a whole bunch of things. So now, so how do we solve this? Well, I mean, this being 2015, there are basically, I would say, two main solutions that are known as of now. I mean, obviously, next year we may be 
looking at new solutions, but here are the two solutions that I really know today. One of them is component-based UI, and I'll talk, Nick alluded to that a bit, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. And the second one is what I'm gonna call stateless approach, uh, using a stateless approach deeper in your stack. So outside of your UI, you want to find a way to deal with your state, and ideally by banishing it from as many parts of your application as possible. Now, obviously your application cannot be entirely stateless, but what we're going to see is how far can we push state management out of it. So let's first talk about component-based architecture. Now, the idea of component-based architecture is that you would build your UI layer of the application as a collection of UI components with well-defined interfaces. Now, and the important part here is the well-defined interfaces, right? Because, I mean, you can take almost any application and even the messiest kind and identify in it something that you could call components and you say well here we've got components we're following component based uh, architecture no, but that's not what we mean right what we mean is that you want those components to be reasonably independent they you don't want your components to reach out into each other you want to really control uh, the interaction between them and, uh, and the important, another important part is that a lot of those components, you cannot achieve it for all of them, but for most of those components, you want to make them agnostic of the application, which is to say that they would have no idea what this application is for, and they would have no dependencies outside of serving a very narrow function within the context in which they exist. Now, why is this good? Well, this helps, first of all, with code reuse. Right? I mean, if you've got components that are agnostic of the application, now, an example of that, think of a date picker. Right? Now, you could implement a date picker in, in a completely generic way so that you could drop this date picker into any form, into any application. You could move it from your, applica your old application to your new application. It, there's no reason why it needs to know what the application is for. It just needs to do one thing. It needs to be able to pick. A date. So now if you actually manage to achieve that, then what you get out of this is first of all code reuse. Right? You can actually go ahead and use the same date picker everywhere you need to uh, need a date picker. The second one is that it really helps with testing because now you could look at testing that component individually and you know that if it works within that context of the test, it's actually going to work in the application because it's not the case that in the context of the application, it, it, its behavior is influenced by million, million other things. And then finally, it also makes it easier to just reason about your code, to understand how your code works. Now, again, the key point there is though, is to making your, your components, and most of them agnostic on the application and, and making sure that all of them have well-defined interfaces. So in order to achieve that, it helps to think of a typology of components. So one type of component is, we're gonna call it the dumb component, is a component that should not be aware of the rest of your application at all. And this is the component you want to primarily be using. The second type is a smart component. Now smart sounds like a good thing, but you actually, this is like too smart often. You, those are components that will actually have hooks into the rest of your application, and by virtue of that, they're not gonna be reusable. And by virtue of that, they also may be potentially contributing to creating a mess where everything is connected to everything. So you want to minimize the use of that, such components. And then finally, there is sometimes you need the smartish components that are sort of in between. And I will talk a little bit about how those would work. So let me give you a um, diagram. And this is, if you watched our July uh, webinar, this uh, I, you might have seen those slides, but I think those slides are really worth repeating. So this is a, how your dumb component would work. It's a In this case, the child component is a dumb component. It lives inside of a parent component, and it's pure, it's fully contained within it. So the only interaction this child component has with the outside world is by sending out events that are picked up by the parent and by having, uh, by having its properties changed by the parents, by the parent, and by adjusting its own properties, which the parent may pick up. Right? There's no way for this child component to communicate with the rest of the application. Right? So if you think of the, like say the date picker example, the date picker cannot go ahead and actually uh, do anything other than firing and 
on like on submit or on selection uh, callback, which will notify the parent that the date was selected. And this is where what most of your components should be should be like. Now the smart components they are a little different in that they actually do communicate with the rest of the application, which naturally, you know, you can you can build your UI out of dumb components, but at some point you need to actually link it together with the rest of the application. This is where smart components come in. You want to minimize them, but you do need them. And uh, those can ev emit events that go to the rest of the application. Now, we'll talk a little bit later about how this would ideally go through some sort of dispatching mechanism. And they will also pick up updates from something outside of the application, which in uh, the architecture we're going to talk about is going to be stores of, of one kind or another. And then finally, the, the smartish components, sometimes it makes sense to actually give your components an ability to emit events into the rest of the application, but not let them actually be controlled by anything outside. So this is, so essentially think of it as a button whose state is only determined by the parent, but it actually has a way of broadcasting events out. The reason this often comes in handy is because if you don't allow for that, then sometimes you just end up with chains of callbacks where uh, you know your one small, one component triggers a callback in the parent, that triggers a callback in the parent, and it just a lot of this could be short circuited if you just agree that a child can simply issue a notification to the to the rest of the application, and it still provides you with a decent amount of uh, isolation as long as it really is done as a in the form of notification where the child component really has no idea of what exactly it is going to be the, the response to that uh, message, but all it can do is can issue a message. Now, let's talk a little bit about components and where they came from and how they how you would do components, whether you can actually need Angular or React to, to do components. So the interesting thing is that, I mean, components have been in Angular pretty much all along in the form of isolated directives. Right? I mean, there's really nothing ever, was ever stopping anyone. Everything you need in terms of framework support is there. Uh, now, Angular also offered a whole bunch of other things, uh, a whole bunch of other models, like, for instance, the dollar scope model, but you really are under no obligation to use it. Now, it's fair to say that the components in Angular were never really fully loved. and uh, even as the community have moved from using kind of dollar scopes based solutions to controller as the isolated directives weren't really properly embraced. Uh, now, in contrast, React really, I think, deserves, the React community deserves credit for re really bringing components into the limelight. I mean, it's, it, it is thanks to React community that really we all started thinking a lot more about components. And what also the React community has done is really really, really help clarify our thinking about components. And from that perspective, if you want to really get your thoughts about components clarified, you want to probably be reading uh, the literature that comes out of the React community, I mean, starting with React uh, documentation. I mean, reading React documentation about co components really, among other things, will help you write better Angular. Now, all of that said, Again, you do have components in Angular 1x. Nothing stops you from using them. And again, a sensible strategy would be to go and read up on React documentation and get your thinking clarified and then come back to Angular 1x and actually start doing what React documentation suggests that you do because it's all doable in Angular, uh, in Angular 1x. And of course, now Angular 2 is really putting components at the center. And in that sense, we are... This, you know, there's a sort of a much bigger focus on it. So, I mean, the bottom line on it is the, on, on this is React community really truly deserves credit for having brought components to everyone's attention, who have really contributed to our thinking about it. But you can do components in, in, in Angular, you could do them in React. There's nothing React specific about this. Now, let's talk about stateless architecture. No, this is shifting towards more the things that happen beyond your UI. And I'm using the word stateless here, which is a bit, maybe a bit of a provocative word because obviously, well, you need some state. And let's first try to understand what's the problem with state and what is it that we are trying to solve there. Now, a lot of us were raised on object-oriented 
programming and one of the key features of object to object oriented programming is that objects are stateful. Now, which means that the effect, when you call a method on an object, the effect of that call depends on both the arguments and the state, the, the object's internal state, which is to say that what has happened to that object before. Now, this has a number of big downsides. So first is that it's actually very painful to test because the behavior really depends on what exact state is. So you, but at the same time, objects don't usually let you control the state directly. So effectively, you need to test for all of the different possible sequences or methods. Because every time you, you can, you cannot just say we want to make call a method and see that the result is this. Because the result is only this when the object is in a particular state, right? Now, you may get a different result when the object is in a different state, but at the same time, state of the object is something you don't normally get to control directly. So that is very painful. Now, the second thing is that they're actually also hard to understand. I mean, this is odd because the promise of object-oriented programming was to be intuitive, but the reality is that it requires you, you kind of do end up having to think about internal state, but internal state is at, at the same time hidden from you. And, now, and why was this all done in the first place? Well, the promise of object-oriented programming was to mimic the real world, but arguably it's trying to replicate the unnecessary complexities, mimics things about the real world that we actually don't want in our computing systems. And it turns out we have a simpler alter model, a simpler alternative that really allows us to organize our programming uh, programs in a more uh, intuitive way, and that's pure functions. So the idea, uh, con con uh, in contrast to an object, a pure function really depends, uh, is a function whose output depends on nothing but it, its input. So if you know what inputs you provide to the function, you know what outputs it's supposed to generate. And a pure function also has no side effect, which is to say there's nothing, it's, it gives you a return value, and other than return value, there's nothing else that happens as a result of calling that function. Now, why are pure functions amazing? Well, first of all, they're really easy to understand, right? Because it's you understand that this is the function transforms this input into this output. That's all there is to it. There's nothing else to keep track of. The second thing is that they're really, really easy to test because you just need to test that for particular input, you get particular output. There is no this worrying about history or what would happen if you know the state were different. And then finally, it's really easy to build complex pure functions by composing simple ones, right? And this is, in object-oriented programming, you often do this through inheritance, but in, in the, with pure functions, you do this through composition. You basically say, well, if we want to get this result, we do this by calling this function, and then calling this function on the output, and then calling this function on the output, and then calling this function on the output. And this is, ends up being really much easier to understand. Now, one of the attractions, one of the big attractions of React is, has been the promise of taking that approach to DOM manipulation. So if React's render method, now I mean React's components are classes, but their render methods all, can almost be like a pure function. It was inspired by the pure functional think, thinking, even though it wasn't really quite, uh, ended up being uh, implemented fully that way. Now, which is to say that in React, instead of, I mean, in many um, frameworks try to save you from DOM manipulation by effectively manipulating DOM for you, but you still logically are doing things that result in, in manipulating DOM. Now, React is different because in React, DOM is not manipulated, it, rather it's calculated. So it's calculated from, in particular, properties of, uh, of your object. Now, comp uh, compo React components also have state, but its use is very limited and you cannot modify it directly and it's kind of like kept at bay. Now, this approach is really attractive because of what I said earlier, though, I mean, it does require some double think. I mean, the reason it requires, I'm, I'm calling it double think, is because you kind of have to believe in a fiction, which is that it's possible to be, the reality is the DOM in your browser is persistent, and it does, at the end of the day, need to be 
manipulated. And you can't actually communicate, you know, recalculate your DOM every time and just stick it into the browser. So uh, React in practice, React allows you to think that you can do that to generate DOM in a kind of through computation, but it then needs to go and actually reconcile this. And this reconciliation works really well in practice in most cases, but then when it doesn't work, then you kind of have to now remind yourself that that's not what is actually happening, that you've been a bit, in a sense, living a lie. Now, in contrast, Angular's components are in a, in a normal, in, by default, they are stateful in a normal object-oriented style. I mean, they have state, and you can actually set component dot something to something else, right? And, um, but it's important to remember that you actually can emulate React style with Angular to a very large extent. Now, but this is, front, this is the actual view. What about deeper down in your layer? Now let's, it, it, with, with your actual application's data. Now let's look again, remind ourselves, how is it that state really becomes painful in a large application? Now what, what happens is we have a component and the component has a model and the component updates the model and the model updates the component and so far so good, but then the trick is that we actually have other components and then we also have other models and then those other models com update other components and other components update other models and before we know there is just everything is now trying to update everything and as if every one of those pieces on top of that is maintaining its own internal state, the opportunity of the reconciliation becomes really difficult and the opportunity for the state to be misaligned becomes tremendous. So that is what makes it all very difficult. Now, so one approach that you could try to solve it with is um, unidirectional, unidirectional data flow using uh, an approach such as, for example, Flux. So in this model, you have your components, several of them, I'm just going to draw two. And you also have, instead of your model, you usually call it a store, but you can think of it as being somewhat similar. What's different is, what's different is the interaction between your components and your store. So in this model, the components don't, do not get to actually modify anything in the store. Instead, you have a box called a dispatcher, and all your components get to do is send messages to the dispatcher. So when the component wants something, it just announces that something so for instance, if a button got clicked because the user wants to add an item to the cart, your component will send out an action, essentially a message, saying new item added to the cart. Now the dispatcher then sends this out uh, to the stores, and now the store can go ahead and uh, either just update itself, or maybe it's going to make go and make an, uh, an API call. And then in the end, when the store has modified itself, it's going to go and make a um, notify the components. So now how do we actually, so now the advantage here is that instead of everything being connected here, we actually have this sort of circular model where components send out actions, uh, stores pick up those actions through the dispatcher, uh, and the stores get updated, and then they notify the components. So everything gets synchronized, right? So in this case, one of the components actually issued the um, the update, and in, in particular within this approach, usually the component will not even go ahead and actually, let's say, even if it has a, uh, you're adding an item to the shopping cart and the shopping cart is, well, usually would be a separate component anyway, but even if it were the same component, you would actually wait to get notified about the addition before you change your um, UI. So now how do you actually implement this? Well, usually you would want to do this by using data stream, event streams. So with event streams, so to implement all of those notifications. So one option with event streams is to use um, RxJS. That's the library that we mostly like. Uh, there are also other popular ones, such as uh, Bacon Highland and a few others. So with this approach, you create a stream. And then you have a stream object, and so whoever is publishing will actually send messages to um, that stream. In this case, let's say my stream dot on next data sends pushes a a data object into a stream. You then can share the stream with other subscribers. Uh, in this case, the store will share, for instance, a stream with um, allow, will allow components to get a stream. And then all of the subscribers can actually now listen by providing a handler function. So this is sort of the mechanics of it. 
Now, this runs into a somewhat nasty problem often. Oh, yeah, and, so, and now in this case, your, your components and stores are still stateful, but your inputs are better controlled. And so you're kind of approaching this more stateful, and your synchronization is resolved uh, much more naturally. So now this does create often a somewhat nasty issue, which is the possibility of your subscribers misbehaving and changing its other data. Now, the reason for this is that every subscriber, when you emit an object onto a stream, every subscriber gets a reference to that object. And what if one of the subscribers decides to modify it? Well, I mean, if they do, then suddenly this will modify this object for everyone else. So what it means suddenly is you no longer can actually trust that the object that you got is going to stay unchanged. And this basically brings the lack of the problem of misynchronization potentially that. So you, in order to avoid this, what we use today for this is immutables. Now immutables can, there's several different flavors on them. So the most basic level immutable data structures are data structures that cannot be changed. And by that, virtue of that, they do not, they do not have state. And they're stateless because they can only be in the, initial, in the one state, which is the initial state in which they were created. But there's a few different ways to do them. Uh, the most simple one is use object.trace. That basically gives you an object that cannot be modified, but the downside of object.trace is that it's shallow. So you will not be able to do, if, you, if x is a object that was frozen, then you cannot set x.y to something new, but you can still set x.y.z to something new because x is frozen, but its child x.y is not. So this, and this is particularly becomes very unintuitive right, when you're trying to think of why is it that you can change x.y.z but not x.y. So if you want something that's similar but really all the way through, then there's a library for that called Seamless Immutable. It really gives you, takes the JavaScript data structure and freezes it all the way down so that you cannot change anything. But the, the catch is that, well, what if you actually do want to modify your data? Now, you say, well, wait, didn't we, weren't we saying that we want immutables? Well, we sort of do, right? So what, we, what happens really is that with immutable objects, we, can, we, we cannot change them. But at the same time, we need to. We need to in the sense that, well, things change in our application. Let's say we have a, our shopping cart. And if our shopping cart is truly immutable, then how do we actually add an item to it? Now, the solution that we use is derivation. So essentially what we want to say is that once a shopping cart is created with three items, that shopping cart, that object can never be modified. So what this means is that whoever got the reference to this object will never have to worry about checking whether there's new items in it. Now, at the same time, what we can do is we can create a brand new shopping cart that now has all of the items from the previous one plus one more. And uh, we would want to do that in such a way that the original isn't altered. So whoever has a reference to the old shopping cart still has it exactly as it was, but whoever, but we now create a new one and we can pass that around. So for implementing, for doing this, the best library out there today is Immutable.js. So this is a library that really allows you to do just that. It allows you to take immutable data structures and derive new ones from them. So here's an example of how it would look. So if your data is an immutable data structure created with immutable JS and it has, you know, like nesting, like foo.bar.buzz, then you will use an operator such as setIn where you provide the path and the value and it will give you a new object that is basically this, a new data structure that is the same, but it now has uh, that one value changed. Now, the important thing here is that the data, the initial data, whoever has reference, like whatever data is pointing to is actually not changed at that point. So this is becomes the immutables in that sense, immutables that are from which new ones can be derived, a really key important building block of stateless architecture. Now, so we can go fairly far with a this approach of flux, where we are having uh, you know single uh, unidirectional data flow. We are communicating through uh, events uh, and event streams, and we are sending it out immutable uh, data structures so that, for instance, when a, you know, some component receives an element that they want to, an object they want to do something with, they actually would derive new ones from it, but they will not be modifying the original one and ensure that uh, they don't mess with anyone else. No, we can do, but I mean, this is not really quite what one, you know, 
what we would want from the perspective of pure functions and also from the perspective of really not getting stuck on dealing with the synchronicity like because that right now we are basically moving from having promises all over our code to having event streams all over our code which is you know can also be fairly painful so there's a great library that we uh like that allows you to really go a step further that's called redux and the key concept of redux is reducing actions so now this is reducing is a concept that's I think a lot of people sort of understand, but maybe not fully, and, and it's, I think, out of the different built-in functional uh, primitives in JavaScript. This is the one that maybe isn't getting quite as much love as the, the other ones, such as map and filter. Right? Everyone uses map and filter, but not a lot of people use reduce. But let me quickly you know, rehash how reduce works. So, I mean, the basic use of reduce would, would look like this. So you do a, you have an array and you do array.reduce and then you provide two arguments. Your first argument is a reduction, a reducer function and your second argument is the initial value. Now what the reducer function does is that it's sort of similar to map, but except for where map takes sequentially each value from the array and gives you the new value, the reduce function takes, the, uh, the reducer takes a value in sequence, first one, then two, then three, then four, then five, and the current state, which starts with, in this case, zero. And it returns a new value that is somehow derived from the state and the, and, and the, and, and you know, it, 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 it returns the new state out of the previous state and the value uh, out that taken out of iteration. So in this case, this is the implementation of summation where we basically say that in order to sum up numbers, we start with zero, and then at each step we take the previous state and we add whatever is the current number. So we say zero plus one, that gives us one, then one plus two, that gives us three, plus three plus three, and so this is the idea of reduction. So in Redux, the key idea is that your app state is basically a reduction over the history of actions. So your actions are um, you know, you could think of them as a sequence, right? And at any given point in time, a certain number of actions have been sent out through the system. And you implement your app as a sequence of reducers, where each reducer basically gets sequentially run on each on the, of the actions in a very similar way, right? So we're here, one, two, three, four, five are the Items in the sequence there, the, it's the actions. The user clicked on the button, the user logged in, the user clicked on the button, the user added an item to the shopping cart, the user added another item to the shopping cart, the user added the third item to the shopping cart, the user entered credit card number, the user clicked checkout, right? So now at any given point in time, you basically will say, we can run the reducers and they will actually convert those into the state. Now, what does this give us? Well, actually, first let me give you an example. So in, in exa here is an example where we have a, um, a reducer that has, um, or rather we actually we create a complex reducer out of simple reducers and each simple reducer gets applied when a particular type of node gets created and in this particular case we're saying when the user have updated the content of the node in our node taking system then we are going to trigger the following action where we're going to go and we're going to um, add a new content in, uh, we're going to find the node uh, inside of our state and we're going to update that node, uh, node's content with the whatever is contained in the payload of, of the action. So this is, uh, and then if we don't have anything to do, then we just return the, um, the, the initial state. So what does this give us? Well, first of all, now the nice thing is that suddenly each reducer is a pure function. A lot of your app is going to be in, the, uh, in more, some of your most complex logic is going to be in reducers, and now they're pure functions, which means that make them really, really easy to test. Now the second thing is that your history can now be rolled back, rolled back and replayed, and that's kind of amazing. So what it means is that uh, you can actually say, let's because you're looking at your application, you're saying, well, let's actually the user. We know the user have added already five items, but let's go back and undo that last action. So we're back to so the Redux can recalculate for you and say, okay, well, if we've only if we haven't done the last action, then we will be in this state. And in this state, there's four items in the shopping cart. And then if we add, if we replay the, the action again, then the fifth um, item is going to get added again. And um, finally, the 
coolest thing is that reducers now can actually stay synchronous, right? Because we're saying that, well, we are, uh, whenever an action happens, we then we, we process that we only provide in our reducer the actual function that is to be run when something happens, rather than specifying those sequences in, in our code. Now, it's worth noting that, of course, handling and synchronous actions is not quite that simple. And generally speaking, you always have sort of two choices in, in the flux or flux style architecture. I mean, either you need to put a bit of logic in your smart act into actions and make them smart actions, or you need to put some of the asynchronous logic into your stores and make them smart stores. So, I mean, Redux is basically going with the smart actions approach. And what this means is that you are um, going to emit an action. So if, if you if something happens that requires, for instance, an, an HTTP request, then what you will do is you will emit an action to let everyone know that the request was made, and then you will emit a new one when the data has arrived. And in that case, everything else in terms of handling this action now becomes asynchronous, and that's very nice. And of course, uh, a lot of the sometimes, I mean, to an extent to which there's ugly details, you want to push them into a module. So now we come back to the question, you know, React or Angular, which one should you be going with? Now, one thing that's worth noting, all of this can be done with either React or Angular. I mean, everything I've talked about, this can be done, and for instance, Redux in particular, there is a React adapter for it, there is uh, Angular adapter. Um, you, you, could use, you, you could use either. Now, Redux aligns conceptually with React a little bit cleaner in the sense that if you actually I really get into the React Redux fine space and then when you switch to the working on the actual React part, it feels very natural. Angular requires you to do a little bit of a translation at the very end, but it's really not a big deal. And um, now the flip side, one thing where Angular um, comes out a little stronger is that Angular makes it a little easier to integrate third-party components, mostly because Angular is in some ways a little bit more honest. I mean, it's basically not trying to hide from you the fact that at the end of the day, what's happening is not manipulation. So if you're actually dealing with components that really heavily go kind of the persistent DOM object that gets manipulated out, then uh, Angular ends up being a little bit more straightforward to think through. So uh, thanks, Yuri. This is uh, Nick. Uh, I'm going to just wrap up with a, a few slides. So you know the the topic of this webinar was how to build large applications with React, Flux, and Angular, and we shared our experiences with large single-page applications and the technology and where our sort of preferred uh, direction is, um, or stack in general. Uh, we work with all of these technologies. So your your question to wrap up is, but what should I do? Right. There's a few key questions you want to ask yourself. How, is, how important is managing state in your application? How large will your teams be? Is the bulk of your logic service oriented or GUI focused? How much GUI component logic is reused across features? And is your application naturally composable from a UI perspective? Now, the, the title of this talk or this webinar was how to build large applications. So I'm going to assume that generally, you know, state is important. Your teams will be large. Um, you have really GUI and uh, service-oriented logic. Um, you want reuse because you're building a large app. It becomes important, and a, large, a lot of large applications are, you know, obviously it's thematic. You want to have a common you know, user experience, and you're doing a similar thing in, in different user flows. And uh, the, I guess the composable aspect of it is, is sort of pretty common as well. Like ultimately, if you're building a large app, there are going to be underlying themes that you should be able to come up with some level of composition um, from a UI perspective, because otherwise you're doing a, a lot more work than you'd want to do. And you have to reason a lot harder. It's hard to figure out what your application does. Composition allows you to reason at a higher level of abstraction and, and break things up. So, you know, I think all of these are probably in play for a large app, you know, like a very large app. If you're a medium sized app, then there might be some other you know, thoughts that you might want to take and, and look into a little more. Uh, a very important question that you shouldn't underestimate is cultural. Like, what does your team want to do? Do they prefer out-of-the-box solutions or to roll their own? Um, you know, working with uh, you know Angular, React, Redux, um, Immutable JS. That's it's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so 
you know, some people want to go with maybe a simpler approach because the, the you know the, they need to have a consensus and they might spend a year trying to finalize their stack otherwise. Um, what can you hire for? Uh, a lot of that will be, depend on your market, where you're working. Um, if you're working in a uh, in an area that's maybe not as exciting, um, you may want to go with a more interesting tech stack to make it more attractive to bring in people. Um, or conversely, if you have you know a lot of existing developers that you have to cross train, then maybe you want to go with something that aligns closer with their expertise because you know, ultimately you want to have successful software. Um, that's being developed and that really depends on on your team that you have now and the team that you're going to have you know a year from now and then there's also you know the philosophical sort of outlook of the team um, do they embrace functional concepts such as immutability map reduce uh, and core react type concepts and uh, you know if you're coming from a very object-oriented culture this might be a big jump so you might want to go with something a little simpler um, it's that's a really hard call to make I and mean, that's probably the most important thing that you'd want to consider before moving forward and do you have if you do want to move in that direction do you have the enthusiasm and technical leaders in your organization to shift your team over you know some final thoughts the more complex the state you know the more that we would suggest looking at functional approaches um, angular 2 provides a comprehensive component model that solves many of the same challenges so you know, if on Angular 1, you may want to move to Angular 2. And uh, you know, as Yuri pointed out, with Angular 1, you can do a component model. It's sort of there. Um, it's just not expressively you know, at the top level. Um, so it's not often missed. and not. It wasn't really considered that important as well early on. So a lot of that early small app literature and learnings in the Angular space really don't have the right architecture. So you know, as a... Uh, as, as a, uh, a heads up, you do not want to build a large Angular application based upon what you've learned in a book, you know, that's two years old or even a recent book because they're all focused on the framework, not the architecture of, you know, and those challenges in a larger application. Um, you know, the type of application becomes more important if it's large, small applications or small applications, you know, uh, write it however you want. You'll be successful using Perl if you want. Um, your final choice is likely to be one more of style rather than specifics. You know, going back to the last two slides and, and recounting, uh, you know, some of the decision points. And uh, as Yuri was uh, sort of showing, Redux is an interesting approach that fits naturally with Angular or React, and it enables stepping out of the purely functional world because in more um, in the UI layer because it's a, it's a bit lower down in your stack. And so you're getting a lot of the functional benefit, but you don't have to do it entirely at the, uh, the UI level. So that sort of concept of thinking about your large application architecture in multiple layers is an important one. And I think that that's something that's going to evolve and have a lot more discussion and clarity around in the next year as we sort of uh, you know, really dive deeper into these large application architectural sort of issues and practices. So with that, uh, thank you.